Welcome, everyone. Today, we have Crystal Meyer with us. Crystal is an expert in organizational psychology. She has a master's and a PhD in it, and she is currently the director of organization development at the Children's Wisconsin. So I am excited because she, we've had a conversation before, and Crystal has faced a lot of the challenges that that we face. And on top of that, she has this whole side of her where she understands a little bit of how the organizational psychology help, works. She has a passion for organizational culture. And you guys know that that is something that I'm passionate about as well. So welcome, Crystal, to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. So we're going to talk a little bit more about you initially before we get into the organizational culture. What were some of the, maybe some of the challenges, some of the the bigger initial challenges that you faced initially, especially, and you mentioned this before, especially when you left home for the first time? Yeah. So when I think about challenges in life, I think back to when I was a kid growing up and I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That's where I was born and raised. And growing up, my family didn't have a lot. It was in the early 70s. And my parents were both from the South. And we moved, they moved, I shouldn't say we, I wasn't here yet. They moved up to Wisconsin and became Yankees is what their family says. My family too. (laughs) And they didn't know anybody. They came to a new part of the country. My dad had um, gotten into Marquette University. And anyways, they didn't have a lot. And so we grew up in probably not the nicest part of town and that's okay. And my parents actually said they did that on purpose. They wanted us to be exposed to diversity early on in life. And so we lived actually in a house that was abandoned and we spent my childhood really fixing that house up. And it was in a neighborhood at the time that was transitioning and they were able to get it to a point putting in stained glass windows and just really refurbishing the house to the beauty that it was when it was built in the early 1900s. Anyways, then we moved and long and short of it, the exposure that I had to individuals changed over time. And I would say that has stuck with me over time. I live in Milwaukee still. I've lived in California in between. So was in Milwaukee, left, went to California, came back. And we live in the city of Milwaukee today for a similar reason that we want to expose our children to really just the beauty of diversity and that we don't, not that there's anything wrong with suburbs. Don't get me wrong. The suburbs are wonderful. And we were very intentional uh, about having experiences that our kids can carry through for their lifetime because the world is a very diverse place. And so we want them to Uh, be able to experience that young. And it forms perceptions and mindsets in children when they have exposure to differences. And I say this because I don't know the viewers are probably from all over the country and Milwaukee tends to be a a pretty segregated city. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's wonderful that you had that experience early on and that you're giving that to your children, because that's something that we always talk about here at home if everybody had the opportunity to be exposed to diversity and not just diversity in the sense of race, um, but all sorts of diversity, I'm going to have a great time talking to you because I didn't study organizational like cultures and things like that. So that's, it's nice to have people like that in my circle of people who are influencing me in a way or not or another. You said you have, have a little bit of a German background as well, right? That's definitely not my background. And sometimes socioeconomic background as well. So it's just multiple levels. And that way we can better communicate and expand our thinking. Absolutely. So I think that's really positive that you intentionally do that. Mm -hmm. And so you went through that experience and I'm sure that enhanced and informed your way of thinking and a little bit of your values and your communication. And Mm -hmm. then you left home for the first time. I did. How was that experience for you? Oh, wow. That was that was challenging. I was so used to because my family is because my family, my immediate family moved away from extended family. We were a very close-knit family. So it was my mom, my dad, my brother, and I. 
And so we did everything together. And so leaving home for the first time, so this is after college, after undergraduate, I had an opportunity to move to California. I had never lived anywhere else. And I thought, I guess this would be the time to do it. I don't have a job yet. I have a a degree. Why don't I check out what the world is like? So packed up a U-Haul truck, drove across country. And it was really a beautiful experience. I had an, I was blessed really. I call it that to where I lived was in the central coast and it was just beautiful. I had never seen anything like that before. I had gone on trips, maybe I think I'd been to California once and it was just so beautiful. I met so many new people and I started working in a beachfront resort and was surfing and doing a lot of fun things. And I ran into a lot of challenges in the sense of when I first got there, before I got that job, I I didn't know anybody. I didn't know how to make friends and who to how to find my circle of people. I also needed transportation. I didn't have a car. I had sold my car before I left because I wanted to start over again. And so I I made a purchase that probably wasn't the smartest purchase. I was really (laughs) attracted to the way that the car looked, but it wasn't really the best car in the world from a reliability. And actually I was driving down the freeway once at, at one point and the engine caught on fire. And so I had to figure out how to get help and who to call and get the car back to my place. And my parents were very helpful. They, When I would get into trouble like that, they would come in and, and help again, which was wonderful. But I had different experiences where I needed to step out of my comfort zone, take a chance, meet new people, try new things. The expansion of the, I talked about earlier before around culture was just a hundredfold. So I got to meet so many different people. And when I looked around, there were, I didn't have to go searching for diversity. It was all around me and it was beautiful. And I just, I loved that. I loved that about California. But again, I didn't know people and I had to figure my way around. And it seemed like every turn that I would take, I would run into kind of an obstacle and, okay, I have to figure this out now, run into another obstacle. Okay. I have to figure this out. And I think that What it taught me was that persistence is so important. I never gave up. I didn't say it would have been easy. There were a couple of things in a row and I can't think about the details of them right now, but it was like, gosh, should I make the right decision? Should I move back home? I'm I'm not really sure if this is really where I should be. I was trying to figure out finances and insurance and all of these things when you're used to, I don't know, not having to think about all that. So it was this perfect time of becoming an adult and also stepping out on my own to, to try some things out. Yeah. I remember, I think most people stepped out of their, let's say city where they lived at some point. And if you did that early on, like you did in your early twenties, then Mm -hmm. there's so much that you need to figure out. And like you said, like the home, the friends, like the car, like all those things. We didn't have AI back then. So it, you can, hey, chat GPT, how do I solve this? You actually had to, at least for me, I don't know about you, but there was an element of needing to seek out answers through people mm-hmm. a lot of the times. Yeah, mm-hmm. Google helped, but also like getting references for things like even finding I don't know if you had that, but you even finding a doctor or a dentist that is someone that you you trust or any kind of professional is difficult to find. It, it really is someone that you yeah. Yes. And there was no Google. This is before <laughs> the internet. Okay. So I'm aging myself, but there was no Google. There was no, this was the let your fingers do the walking with the telephone book and oh my God. really piecing things together. Yeah. It was a completely different way of living. And yeah, maybe it would be a different experience now if people would take that opportunity. And then the, we are, I think, a more mobile environment where people probably are building their careers and moving around and trying different things. I didn't have, I didn't move out for a job. I didn't move out for a That's person. Right. I, I moved, moved out just to 
try it. <laughs> so you have to like figure out the job, you have to figure out living yeah. situation, you have to figure out everything because most people would get a job and then the the people in the company would provide the support to figure out all the other yes. elements of the equation. Mm -hmm. But when you go somewhere, that's brave to go somewhere <laughs> by yourself, not you not even having a job, not knowing how things work. And some things are amazing. And you're probably, like you said, there were so certain things that amazed you, but there are other things that probably you didn't expect and how hard it would be to deal mm -hmm. with. And even for me in my twenties, my early twenties, like picking up the phone and calling someone that I didn't know to try to get an answer to some a question, mm -hmm. that was uncomfortable. I didn't want to do it. There was a resistance to pick up the phone and dial the number. Yeah, that and I had just come out of college. So I have an uh, undergrad in psychology and criminology. I also had gotten a CNA because I thought I wanted to work in a psychiatric ward and you need a CNA in order to do that. So I thought that would be a good way to get my foot into, into the door. And where I moved, although I was talking about how beautiful it wasn't like there were a lot of big industries around there. So I was really starting from, I don't even know where. I should look for a job. I don't know really what my skill set is yet. I've been in school my whole life. I had I had some odds and end jobs, but I didn't have I didn't have an established career or career path and I was still trying to figure myself out. That was challenging in and of itself of where should I even apply? What would I be qualified to do? So I just started putting out resumes to all different types of places. And actually, my first job was as a teller at a bank. And I met a woman that became a really good friend of mine. And so then I, I started to build some of those friendship circles. And I had somebody to go on walks at night and talk about my deepest, darkest secrets with. And I wanted that. I missed that because it was I would call home. Uh, but it's harder to have that deep relationship with people over the phone. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. So you were brave. You explored new territory in California. And another thing that you shared was that you've had the experience of having to speak to large audiences. Mm -hmm. Was it ever scary for you? Because for most people, it's pretty scary. Oh, yeah. I So I was working and I thought, I can keep doing this. I love the culture out here. I love living by the beach. And yeah, like I said, I was surfing and going on cruises and testing product for vendors who wanted to get them into the beach resorts. I was like, I could do this. But in my mind, I thought, no, I really want to, I want to use the degree that I have. I want to do something with that. And really, I, I pulled out an old psychology book and I thought, what can I do with psychology? And I looked at the different, I looked at the different, I, I pulled out my old psychology book and I looked at the different specialties within psychology and I found organizational psychology. It was a mixture between business and psychology. And because I had been working in some industries, I thought business is really good and I want to know more about it. And so I started applying to graduate schools and got into a graduate school in California. And so stayed out there for four more years for that uh, new adventure. Everything that I did, I called it an adventure. So with that, with business and psychology, I was taking courses. I was with a cohort of people that I was learning with. I remembered back in high school, whenever I had to get up in front of a, just a, a classroom of people, I'd get the, what do you call that when you like hives on my face would turn red and I'd get the blotchiness and my hands would shake and I'd be really nervous because I was really worried that I would say something wrong or do something that would be judged. And as I learned through school and just doing it more and more, because the school that I went to was an applied school. So we did a lot of group pro projects and presentations and a lot of research. And I just had to start doing it more. Now, my cohort was, I think, around I'm going to say 18 people. So it wasn't really large. And then I started working and consulting 
and working in businesses where I would be working with teams of people where maybe there were 30. So I kept building up the numbers of individuals. And in my mind at one point, it was, if it's under eight people, I'm fine. If it's over eight, I'm not. So I don't know where that number came from, but that was in my head. And so anytime I'd be in like a a meeting where there's a, a table full of people, that was no problem. But as soon as I had to stand up or speak on a topic, I would get very nervous. And I think what helped me through that was repetition. And then also at some point, somebody said to me multiple times, and it wasn't just me, I had heard this when just through learning and, and absorbing is that it's not about you. When you're speaking in front of people, it is not about you. It's about the message that you're delivering. It's about the outcomes. It's about the insights that you're trying to build in other people. And so when I changed that mindset for myself, that It really doesn't matter what I do or what I'm saying or how I look. That's a moment in time. It's really about why am I there and how am I impacting the people that I'm talking to? Now I talk to in front of hundreds of people and it's not, I don't even think about it anymore, to be quite honest, which is a long way from having this secret number in my head of eight people is what I'm comfortable with. Oh my gosh. Eight people. (laughs) So funny. I guess eight people is what you can fit in one of those conference tables that are common in in offices. And you (laughs) said something, which is, I experienced as well, which is as long as you were sitting down and presenting at the table at the same level as everybody else, it Mm. was okay. But as soon as you had to stand up in front of everybody, it was less okay. And Mm. I think that's because at that point, when you're standing up, you're actually commanding attention to yourself. Mm. Like if you're in a meeting, sitting around a table and you really want people to pay attention to you, stand up, right? I'll get you. And I think that's really uncomfortable for a lot of people. Maybe that was uncomfortable mm. to you, just that attention. Exactly. Yeah. I didn't want that attention. I didn't want that, that visibility. What's really interesting about it is that for the past, I would say, I'm going to say at least 15 years, I stand when I work. I do not sit. So I am in, uh, most of my work is virtual now since uh, COVID. So for the past three years, I've been uh, more hybrid and I could tell a whole story about that and why, but uh, when we came to home, you know, working at home, I set up my grandpa's old drafting table. He was an architect and it was really big. So I could put a lot of things on it and you couldn't move it up and down. It was just at one level. So I didn't want to have it at a level that was low. I put it at a higher level and I started saying, now that was three years ago. Before that, I had one of those desks that would go up and down. I would keep mine up for the most part, or I sat on a ball. So I haven't sat in a chair during the day for probably over 20 years. Anyway, but to your point about standing and even like power poses, if you look at some of the research around just two minutes and you make your body big instead of small, that really changes your chemical makeup. Maybe some of this, if we really if we really pull it apart and, and the psychology of it is that I'm standing all the time and I've got my legs far apart and I'm constantly moving my body around. That may elicit some confidence as well. You're right. It, it definitely does. And like you said, repetition and focusing less on yourself and more on the message and what you're trying to give, gift the audience with your wisdom. And, and well, that, and, and I think it depends on the, what the objective is, right? Sometimes it's a give of uh, perspective and expertise or presentation. Sometimes it's more of a, a facilitated session where you're actually having the audience come up with the answers and build those insights And you're just the person making that happen. So that's when it really turns more on the audience and, you know, they're doing a lot of the work more than the presenter is. It is. So now that you've gone through that, you have a new mindset around it. Is presenting something neutral for you, a neutral activity, or is it something that you enjoy? That's a good question. I would say it's probably a little bit of both. Sometimes I like I'm not a woo. I don't, if you think about strengths, I don't have woo, but I do like entertaining, but maybe there's some sort of a, I don't know, 
I don't know where that comes from. So that's the part that I like. I like really seeing those insights or having people come up afterwards and talking about what what resonated for them. And at the same time, it's not something that I seek out. So I would say it's neutral, but it is just part of being in the role that I'm in and the work that I do that presenting is part of it. So I don't fight it. Let's just put it that way. I don't get, oh, you're going to be speaking in front of all of the leaders next week. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not, oh, and I know some people who are like, oh, I really don't want to do that. And <laughs> oh, that's terrible. I'm going to lose sleep at night. I don't do there that. There are parts Thank of it that you, it seems like you enjoy, whether it be in some instances, the entertainment side or hearing <laughs> how it impacted or, or helped other people afterwards when they, when they comment on it. And I think that's also a nice trick, which is to focus our attention on those parts of it. Maybe it's not the actual presenting part that's satisfying, but maybe it's the result of, pre of presenting mm -hmm. that is the most satisfying part. Yeah. And we know that presenting is like one of the top three fears of everybody <laughs> in the world. <laughs> so that's a natural fear for people to have. And sometimes it can become paralyzing. So that is where I think it's important for, yeah, to break it down. And honestly, I think it's through doing some things you can take a class and you can learn the tactics and you can, okay, you stand this way and you look this way and you say these words and avoid the ums and the ahs and all of the, that technical piece when really it's, there's a lot of other parts to it about just doing it, just experiencing it and making mistakes and giving yourself the permission to be human and that we're not perfect. And it's okay if you say, certainly if it distorts the message and becomes distracting, that'd be something to work on. But the fact that somebody's doing it and repeatedly doing it, they're going to get better at it no matter what, what they do. Yeah. And it's so funny. Uh, you just said it, just do it yesterday. And when I was recording someone else for the podcast mm -hmm. her recommendation was just do it and one of my taglines that have helped me speak up for a very long time and I have it written here on my little art framed is just do it mm -hmm. so there's a little sign for our listeners three just do it just, just do it, it. Just some try it what it yeah. takes yeah and if you don't do as well as you wanted or it wasn't in your mind perfect do it again. Think about what you could do differently. If, especially if something's recorded and you see yourself, I know a lot of people don't like watching themselves. I'm one of them, but the nice part about that, the gift of that is that you can say, hmm, I, I liked when I did that. I didn't like when I did that. And how can I do that different? Absolutely. It's, it is that growth thinking all the way. Now you said something, Crystal, that I want to explore. Oh, yes. You said that every time you had this new change in your life, you saw it or you called it or you envisioned it as a little adventure. And that really spoke to me because I'm a little bit like that. I never called it that way, but mm -hmm. I like the sense of adventure. And when something is a little bit scary, it can also be a little bit exciting and mm. by calling it and labeling it, it's a little, it's an adventure. And that just shifts everything from, oh my gosh, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I'm alone to this is an adventure. And as kids, haven't we all been reading these adventure little books because of how <laughs> sweet and wonderful it is? We all want an adventure. So you had yes. all these wonderful adventures. Yes, with challenges. Yes, with struggles. But you called them adventures. So tell me more about that. I love that. Yeah. I, it's so interesting because as you get older, you learn more about yourself, of course, and you also learn more about the psychology of things. And I am high thinking about strengths again, I'm high positivity. So when I come up to a situation, I don't think about typically now, certainly that doesn't mean that everything is great. But when I personally come up to a situation, I look at the opportunity. I look at what 
what good is going to come from this as opposed to all of the other things that you could focus on. And it's probably pretty common if you think about life and what's good and what's not good. We tend to focus on the 10 to 15 percent that isn't that good. And that's what we're focused on instead of the 80 to 85. That's, you know, good. And yes, I think that when I moved away from home and I had that opportunity to test myself, to do new things, always thought of it as an adventure. I thought of it as the opportunity that I was gifted this chance in life to try something different. And when I stepped into something new, it didn't always work out. It wasn't always everything is great. And and like I said, in my mind, I was thinking, gosh, did I make the right choice? Should I keep going? Should I just go back home and where it's safe and where I know what I know what I'm getting into. And no, that sense of adventure and what is on the other side and what could this be? Adventure is, it, it is a mindset and it is a way of taking that positivity and looking around the corner and thinking about what could be as opposed to what what's going to be bad. What could be, what could be, <laughs> I like that. I'm actually taking notes here because it's the first time that someone talks about this idea of adventure. And I think it's so crucial when you're moving cities, when you're starting a new job, when you have to embrace public speaking, whatever that is, Mm. what could it be? And, And having, you know, that idea of optimism, which sometimes if we're not that naturally optimistic and positive, we can just put a name that is positive to a circumstance. And I think it'll start helping us develop that that positivity and adventure is a wonderful word word we should all be using the word adventure i also think that the part of this is around purpose so if people think about what is your purpose in life or what are you trying to accomplish what do you want what make what drives you what makes you tick what makes you get up in the morning my purpose is around experiencing life my purpose is around the opportunities that I find and how to make things better, how to, and it it could be seen as cliche. Sometimes you always want to leave something better than the way that you found it. To me, that's an opportunity. And then the adventure part of that is how you get there. It's the journey. Sometimes I think we're just trying to go from one thing to the next and days can become long and monotonous and we're doing the same things over and over again. And then you go to sleep and you wake up and, oh my gosh, it's already Friday. How did that happen? And where's my life? And I really am intentional about pausing and thinking and appreciating and taking a walk during the day to slow time down and to really see life as something that's beautiful. And I know that could be seen as, oh boy, not everybody sees it that way, or they, there are a lot of headwinds that can really make it not so for so many. And so I I appreciate that. And I realize that. And I think that half of the battle is your mindset because you can determine you can change that path and that trajectory. I was out in California, didn't know anybody, didn't have a job, didn't have insurance, didn't have. And I came out of California with a PhD. Why? Because I, I took the opportunities and kept building the pieces. Now, I'm not saying that everybody could or should or would do that. I'm just saying that that mindset of pushing yourself forward is helpful. And, and that's what a lot of psychology is the mind that has so much power in how Mm. how we frame things, how we think of things. Yeah. And I don't want it to come off as, oh, everything's great. And there's never anything wrong because trust me, I have bad days. I've got a lot of those, but that doesn't, I see those as blips. That's not the overall. And there's always, I talk to my kids about this all the time. There's always a new day. There's always a reset. There's always a way to overcome whatever you had today. Tomorrow is another opportunity. There's always a reset. And so you did your undergrad, your master's and your PhD in psychology and organizational psychology. And now you're passionate and you work with organizational culture. Mm -hmm. So how did that come about for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as I was transitioning into that more finding, where do I go and how do I fit into this business world, there was something that I was observing in the um, organizations that I had worked in. And what I was observing is 
the higher up I went and the higher up of individuals that I was working with, it seemed as something changed. It seemed as if there was a disconnect between what, in my mind, leadership and senior decisions that were being made to me in the front line and where that disconnect was coming from. And I became fascinated with it. I wanted to understand what this, so this was my impetus was why in my mind, do people change as they go up the ladder in an organization? Where is that turning point? What is that thing? What are those? I wasn't even thinking about like the politics of the organization or anything like that. It was just more of like from an individual perspective, because that was where my mindset was at the time around psychology and individuals and what makes people tick. So that was why I was fascinated with what, what happens in an organization where individuals So I started doing more research on that and it led me into organizational psychology, which is really around systems and group dynamics and people and individual team and organizational dynamics and culture. My dissertation is actually on culture and it is how does the vision of an organization and the communication of that vision and alignment with those who are doing the work impact their intent to stay or leave their commitment and their performance. And I designed a a tool and validated it because there really wasn't any empirical research. There was a lot of anecdotes of this is important and you need to do it, but there wasn't any empirical research that would say this equals that. Anyways, I created a, a, a measurement tool. I got a really big sample size. I validated it. And I actually found statistical significance that the more that vision and mission are communicated and communicated in a way that people understand it, it actually impacts their intent to stay, their commitment and their performance. So with that culture and vision and leadership are all part of that. And so I just, again, I feel so lucky that I get to work with organizations to help shape that. And to me, and this again may sound simplistic, but we spend most of our life working. Most of our time is doing this type of thing. And some of us really what we do, some of us do it because we feel like we have to do it. Either way, I was interested in making that experience the best that it could be. And there's so many different facets of that and the overarching is culture. Oh, wow. I like your research that, that you did. I'm actually very interested now. If you have a, a summary somewhere, I'd love to see it because sometimes we wonder how that vision and mission really affect people. And I remember with my team once, I tried to create a, a team vision and a team mission, a sub little mission and vision just for us. And I wanted it to be a, a, a team process for us to do it together. And right. I was trying to bring significance to what we did and, and create like a little opportunity, something that we could bond us together as well. And I just, I didn't feel like it was making the impact that I wanted it to make. And maybe if I had read your research earlier, I would have felt more confident about it, but I, or I would at least know how to better communicate it in a way that does lead to more what you said, performance, engagement. Yeah. I think the biggest mistake is setting it and forgetting about it. That's common. And even that that saying is prevalent, right? And it's real. It happens. We put all this time and work into crafting the perfect thing. And then what? It just sits there or something else happens or there's another flavor of the day or something changes. So then we forget because we get, you know, sucked into this other thing that we're focused on. You've heard the saying strategy, culture, each strategy for lunch, right? So you can have the best laid plan. And if you're not actually reinforcing it and you're not, and that the behaviors that you're reinforcing and the values that support that culture, that, that enhances that strategy in order to be able to achieve it, it, it's not going to happen. You just answered why I failed. That's exactly (laughs) it. I did not reinforce it. I did these sessions and then Mm. I just let it sit there. Mm. That's it. There's always something to learn. There you go. 
That is wonderful. I love that. Is there anything else you want to share around what you find the most fascinating or what you like, or maybe something that you've seen or an opportunity that you see when it comes to organizational culture? Yeah, I think I've seen a couple of themes over my career and change is prevalent. There is a lot of change going on in the world in a lot of different sectors. You think about the economy and then you think about even just different industries within the within the world and the changes that are happening, whether it's internal because you want a new product line or it's external because of what's happening with the economy or politics or whatever the case may be, change is going to happen. And what I have seen um, in organizations is when change is happening and the organization is trying to figure out how they stay competitive and you know what that um, strategic advantage is and a strategy gets rewritten, I think where I have seen the biggest success factors is when an organization doubles down on culture. If when an organization is shifting their strategy and they're also trying to figure out what their culture is at the same time, that is when I have seen it go not get, can get off the rails a little bit. If you've got a, a defined culture and something that you're trying to reinforce and you change your strategy, you can adjust culture, but you're not reinventing yourself at the same time. Now, some of that has to do with organization size. Some of it, there's a lot of factors that go into that. It's just, it's a very overarching statement that the more stability in one part, strategy and or culture, the better the outcome on the other end, instead of all together, everything's changing. There, It's too many shifting grounds for the people who are there and experiencing it to know what to hold on to. Yeah. And there are two such important parts of that working experience the mm -hmm. the shift in strategy which is big and scary and the culture which is comforting and can be predictable so having that solid culture i think yeah you're right makes a huge difference and it's hard what i'm saying isn't oh great yeah just keep the culture the same change your strategy you'll be fine because sometimes you need to adjust. i mentioned adjusting you you, there's there could be behaviors that need to be different. And it's in how we talk about even from performance, there's the what and the how is so important, because that's really what what's the glue, what's the, the sticky thing that actually makes the change happen. That's that to me is the magic sauce is in the how. Yeah, the magic, so much magic today. I <laughs> really enjoyed our conversation, because we talked a lot about a lot of things, uh, the, the idea of taking on these adventures whenever there's a challenge in our life, whenever we need to experience something new. And by thinking first of purpose and what that purpose is, and then using the adventure to get there and enjoy the journey. And it's all reframing things as a positive mindset. And then to overcome the, the fear of presentations, which like you said, is like one of the top three fears that people have. Just do it. And thinking more of contributing, it's not about you, it's about what you're sharing with others and the message and finding the, those things that you enjoy in that. And then one of the key takeaways for me as well is this idea of communicating vision and mission, but making sure that we keep reinforcing that over and over again and don't let that fall. And then finally, really focusing on a strong culture that will then facilitate change in other areas of the business. And we'll create a, a, a smoother how uh, for people. So lots of great tips. Thank you so much, Crystal. You're Thank you. It's been a good conversation. Yeah, I really enjoyed it.